Hello and welcome to Author Nation Interviews. I am Melody Ann, your host. And today we are immersing ourselves into storytelling. Really important for nonfiction authors. So if you're looking for resources, you will find them at Author Nation at authornation.online. That is scrolling past you right now. It'll also be in the show notes. All right, grab your favorite drink, settle into a cozy nook. Let's introduce our guest. Uh, Ethan Gallagly, PhD, has been a leader in the Sierra Club, the Cal Hiking and Outdoors Society, and the Outdoors Club of Southern California. His boots have covered countless miles, including the John Muir Trail, the High Sierra Trail, the Theodore Solomons Trail, and over 900 miles of the Pacific Crest Trail. He was a reviewer for the Wilderness Press Guides, Sierra North, Sierra South, and Yosemite National Park, and has read nearly every book about the history of Sierra Nevada. His award-winning novel, The Trail, is authentically set on the John Muir Trail. Let's welcome our guest. Hello, Ethan. How are you today? Hi, Melody. Uh, I, I'm well. Thank, thank you for having me on your show. Absolutely. I'm actually really excited about talking to you because I, I also love hiking and I'm up in uh, Canada. And so I tend to go uh, into the Rockies up here. So I'm nice. really excited to hear about, you know, your experiences where you are. And so let's talk about your book, The Trail. It, it beautifully combines fiction and real knowledge about the John Muir Trail, a real place. So can you share more about the inspiration blend, um, behind blending your experience with you know hiking and a fictional narrative sure so i hiked I, i've been hiking for about 30 years i i just i love backpacking camping and and the mountains and i, I i'm sure you can understand being being a hiker yourself so i i hiked the john muir trail which is a 211 mile trail from yosemite national park to the top of mount whitney which is the tallest peak in the in the continental united states and it took me about 28 days it was the first time i had ever done such a long immersive backpacking trip i think before that the longest i had done was about 10 days and the whole experience just blew me away. It was absolutely magnificent. The scenery, the people I met, um, just being out of touch with civilization that long, it, it's, it's meditative. And I really wanted to convey all this to people. And I was scheduled, I, you know, I'm a retired college professor. I was scheduled to give a talk about the trail at my college and in typical professor nature, I went and started researching the history and background, which I had known nothing about when I hiked it. And I realized there's a ton of stuff here. It's very interesting. And then my lecture was canceled. Uh, they, they had a very famous guest speaker come in. They needed my time slot and I was preempted. And I sat around, I was kind of depressed about not being able to give the lecture, but it turned out to be very fortuitous because I looked at what I had and I said, you know, I've got enough material here for a book. But you asked about the narrative and I chose to go with a fictional narrative loosely based on my own experiences as, you know, over 30 years as a backpacker and leader. But I thought a lot about, you know, if I wrote a book about the history and the background of the John Muir Trail, I mean, how many people would read that? You know, I, it's pretty esoteric. I, I, I probably can count the people on two hands, you know, that would want to read that book. Whereas I wanted to convey the experience. I wanted to convey what it felt like to be in the wilderness that long. Who are these people out there hiking? And I wanted a, a compelling story. There, there are a lot of, um, what do you call them? I'm blanking on the word. But there are a lot of, uh, I hiked this trail, here's my ex memoirs. There are a lot of memoirs out there and some excellent. You know, Cheryl, Cheryl Strade's Wild is, is a beautifully written example. Um, and others are really, really, I, I hate to say it, but really dull where it's like, 
day, you know, day one, I did this. Day two, I, you know, I woke up, packed my stuff and walked. And I, I didn't want that kind of book either. So I turned it into a traditional narrative that I knew the general public would read, would get excited about, would be into the story, but able, you know, to draw them in and then convey day by day what it's like to be out in the wilderness that long, blend in a little philosophy, a little history, and really share my own love for nature and hiking with with the reader. So um, that that was the motive for, for making it a fictional book. And I just want to add something funny here, which is the number of people, and, and as your audience are, are authors, the number of people who have written to me and complained. They say, you know, I was so disappointed because at the end of the book, I, I explain, you know, that it, it's based on my hikes, but it's not a true story. And the number of people who wrote to me and complained saying, I thought this was a true story. I was so disappointed to find out it's not. And what's funny about that is right there on the cover, I, I should grab the book. It says, The Trail, a novel. And so it, it is amazing to me how many people do not know the definition of the word novel. And so I, I just caution your authors, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> I almost want to put on the cover, The Trail, a novel, parentheses of fiction, you know, work of fiction or something, but it's, yes. it's half fiction. Yeah, well, and then exactly. And the, what's interesting about that is, as you said, sometimes if you just, you know, I'm just going to lay out the lore and, you know, my philosophy and the history and, you know, all of this, then people, you know, it's it's not the same as a narrative. It doesn't have the same grab the reader as a narrative does. So your, you know, the, the trio blends humor and philosophy and trail lore. So how did you balance all of these out? Because this is, you know, the the philosophy and the and the trail lore, this is this is the real stuff. This is the nonfiction piece. So how did you blend that and create a narrative that resonates with that diverse audience? Uh, so hikers and, you know, uh, people who are maybe just looking for the meaning of life. Well, I, I mean, that's all in there. It's kind of interesting, but it was absolutely natural for me. This, this wasn't a difficult thing to plan out. I, you know, I, so I taught science, but I love philosophy. I I'm fluent in Chinese. I've been overseas. I've read you know, all the translations from, you know, the, 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 the protagonist, he's, he's a young guy, but he goes hiking with an older guy who's a retired Berkeley philosophy professor. And it was easy for me to get into the older character because, you know, all the translations he does from Chinese and so forth, I, I did all those myself. It was very natural for me to bring those elements together. I, I, I just don't think it took any weaving for me so much as writing what I felt was important on the trail. The only thing that was interesting was the chapters, I wrote them out of order, if that makes sense. Yeah. As I got inspiration, as things happened, as things hit me, I would write different scenes. And then over time in the edits, I would move them around, make them fit to the various locations, and you know, then go back and research history if there was something interesting there. So it was very much out of order in terms of writing. It wasn't just a linear book, but it was natural for me. I, you know, if, if I was out biking and something hit me that this would be great in the book, I'd pull over, start writing notes frantically, and then when I got home, start putting together that that chapter. And it's it, brilliant. It very organic. Yeah. And and thank you for saying that you didn't feel the need to write it in chronological order. Because that's something I think authors get stuck on. They think they have to write everything, you know, in chronological order and they can't jump around. And just because you're going to knit it together at the end in chronological order doesn't mean that if you have inspiration one day, you should leave it alone. You know, jump on that inspiration, right? And and something else you said popped up a question for me. So when you talk about philosophy, are you talking about both Eastern and Western philosophy? 
in the book? Mostly Eastern. Um, that's where my background is. I've read a tremendous, I, you know, I, I've read a tremendous amount of, of Asian philosophy, both in the original and, and in translation. And given that, I mean, that was the impetus for making Sid a, a retired professor of Asian philosophy was great. I can weave in what I'm comfortable with. And, you know, that's, I, th I think that's very important. And I think for your, your listeners and your viewers, if you're going to write a book, it needs to be what you know. I mean, if I set out to write a book about firefighting, I know nothing about firefighting. Yeah. I would have to go and work and live with firefighters and, and spend time and really absorb that culture before I feel I would have enough knowledge to be able to write that book. And you wouldn't just want to write it out of your imagination. That that would be, I, I think you'd, you'd, you'd be doing a disservice. So, I mean, I, it's an old adage, but write what you know. Absolutely, yes. And that's usually nonfiction authors are wanting to write because they have an expertise and they want to share the expertise. Normally, that's what's that's what's going on. Although there are people who write uh, biographies and whatnot as well. And something you did, although this is fiction, something you did, which I thought was amazing, was you had, if I remember, 43 maps and sketches yes. by a uh, mountain illustrator. I want to get his name right. Jeremy uh, Ashcroft. Mm -hmm. So can you elaborate on this collaborative process with the illustrator and how the visual elements uh, contribute to the reader's experience and understanding of the trail? Sure. So because the book is set in nature on a trail and the topography of the trail is important to the story, I really wanted to have maps. I, I'm a maps guy. I love looking at maps. And I think there's something nice about it. You know, when I was a kid, we'd read books like Treasure Island and there, there'd be a pirate map in the cover. And I would spend hours staring at that map and thinking about where are they now? I just love that look and feel. And I wanted that in this book. I really wanted to have that old fashioned, there are maps, there are sketches of iconic landscapes. You know, there, there's a number of uh, illustrations Jeremy did as well that are just fantastic, like the Muir Hut and this rock monster you encounter on trail. And so, I was looking for somebody to do this. I didn't know who I was going to end up with. And I was talking with a, a friend of mine who's very into the Muir Channel. It's like, well, you know, there's this guy, Jeremy Ashcroft. He's always posting his drawings online. You might talk to him. And I did. And, and Jeremy's in the UK. He's been working on different books of the topography of the various trails and, and you know, high peaks in the Sierra. So that's right down his alley. He does exactly this kind of illustrative cartography. And so I told him what the project was about. I said, you know, you have some existing work I'd love to use. And here's what I'd, I'd need created. We discussed it. We went through kind of what the maps would look like, the look and feel I was going for, something very simple, but that lets the reader in three dimensions perceive what that day's hike is about and can see the passes and the hills and the peaks and all this. And I, I think it came together beautifully. I, I, I love the look and feel and I love what he's done for the book and the illustrations. Yeah, oh, that's great. And I know as a hiker myself, if I'm going to go on a big hike, you know, you get one of the you know trail map books, you're looking, you wanna look at the maps and then I want to look at photographs because the maps don't tell you what it's like underfoot. And so there's so much that, you know, maps, illustrations and photographs can help you understand what, you know, what you're in for as a hiker. And so how did you want those illustrations to enhance the reader's experience? Well, again, you know, I you can describe with words things, but it's that, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. You're standing at the edge of Cascade Valley and you've got these waterfalls in the distance and the trail winding up and so forth and you can describe this but it's nice to have a little sketch as a reference so the person can really get a sense of 
the scale of these things. Or like I said, that rock monster, that's a very iconic thing along the trail. Somebody's gone and taken a big boulder and put little teeth and eyes in it and so forth. And I can describe it, but to see it, you know, in a black and white sketch really gives you the image of these things. And so I, I did that with the most iconic spots. And then like you say, for the topography, um, it, yes, I can do it in words, but for some, for someone like me, I want to see the topography. I want to look at a map. I want to think about it. Um, my reviewers, when I, when I passed the book out, the pictures were not yet ready. And to a person, they said, we didn't need the maps. We were fine. We could imagine everything you were talking about. But I still go back to that Treasure Island book. There's something nice about yeah. having the maps there. And all the terrain I describe is accurate. I mean, I, I hiked the complete trail when I was 50. But when the book was about to come out, I went back with my son and rehiked the entire length of the trail with my manuscript, checking the visuals, the details. You know, there were only a few things I had to change, but I wanted it to be perfect. I wanted it to be um, a book that you could take on trail and read chapter by chapter as you hiked and go, yes, this is exactly what it was. That's Brilliant. I mean, that's absolutely brilliant. And so, you know, you're just talking about this, but so you had firsthand experience with the trail. Um, and so how did that shape the authenticity of the book? And then from that, what advice do you have for other nonfiction authors who want to kind of get that authentic authenticity accurate uh, for their reader's experience? Well, again, so you know, for me, it, it was having done it, I just had sort of photographic impressions in my mind of each of these places. And I remember very clearly what it was like day by day. And so the, the hike Sid and Gil, Sid, yeah, Sid and Gil take in the book is with two exceptions, the itinerary I took on my very first JMT through hike from end to end. And I think for authenticity, you just have to immerse yourself in whatever it is you're doing. So again, with the firefighters, you'd have to live and breathe and work with the firefighters for months before you'd be ready to write a book about firefighters. Uh, for me, I'm, I'm a hiker. So, you know, this, this was very natural for me, but I still went back, as I said, to double check everything. And I, I think it's very important. I know also when I was doing the history, I passed the book around with a bunch of experts. I gave a copy of the book uh, to Lizzie Wank, who not only knows the history, but she has the best selling book on, you know, a guide to the John Muir Trail. So she knows that trail intimately. And, you know, she caught a few mistakes. She's like, you know, you said they saw this particular bird here, but this bird would never be here. It would be over there. You know, little details that make it really, truly authentic. And I passed it to some people who are very good with uh, the history of the Sierra. And they they said, oh, my God, you you called it this. Call, you know, it's just changing a word, but it's those details that are important. So I think... The other thing to do is do not be afraid of editors. Do not be afraid of experts. Pass your book around because much better to have the expert fix some little thing than be embarrassed later when it's on, on the bookshelf. Yeah, absolutely. And, and although I work with nonfiction authors, the reality is if you're writing a fiction book about, as you say, firefighters or hiking of the John Muir Trail, you better get the facts right. Yes. Because you need to do the research and you need to get the facts right because readers want that authenticity, whether it's, you know, nonfiction, obviously, or even fiction. They want that authenticity. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I've, I've seen some reviews of other books online where they were not well done that way and the, the authors get slammed. I mean, I would hate to be that person. I, I really love when I get a review from somebody who says, I've hiked the Muir Trail and this is exactly what it was like. You just brought me back there. You know, that just thrills me when people say that. 
Nice. I also liked what you said about this is the book to take on the trail with you and read as you go and, you know, make that an experience. I, I think that would be a, a lot of fun. So tell us, is there anything else about the book you want to tell us uh, as we're wrapping up? Well, I mean, just story-wise, it's about a young gentleman named Gil who's <laughs> he's stuck in his life. He's wasting his life. And he gets sort of the call to adventure from Sid, a retired philosophy professor who is dying of cancer. And it's his last chance to go out and hike the trail and experience nature. And so he invites Gil to join him. Gil doesn't want to go. He's not ready to go, but he agrees. And what follows is really the story of the interaction of these two men set as we've said in a very authentic setting and how nature transforms them. So th those are the things, you know, in the philosophy and history, I, I really wanted to get across with this book. Yeah, brilliant. And we can get your book at Audible or on Amazon or at, you know, order it through a local bookstore. Um, yes. And yeah. if the bookstore doesn't have it, it's distributed through Ingram and, and they certainly can order it. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Have we missed anything? Well, uh, you had sent me some, some show notes and had asked uh, what advice I would give to other writers. Brilliant. Um, there's a couple of things I, I would say. First, we, we did cover this, but I would say hmm. consider your audience. You know, if, if you're going to write a book and it's going to be about some really esoteric topic like the history of differential equations, and there's only going to be eight people in the world who's gonna, who are going to read it, do you really want to spend five years writing that book, right? If you're in academia, maybe. But this, this is why I went to fiction, is I wanted to reach a broad audience. Um, I'd also say edit, 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 edit. Uh, I, I, this book for me went through nine edits before I, I thought it was ready and my readers thought it was ready. And Brilliant. marketing. Um, I, I, I hate to bring up marketing. Um, I, I think as an author, it's sort of a, a torture, but... Oh. No one, no one, and this is what I learned, no one markets your book for you. You may have it published with the biggest publishing company in, in, in the world, and you still have to get out there and market it. No one will do it for you. And it's really difficult sometimes. It's a chore. You have to be extra, extroverted and then share your work with folks like, like we're doing on here. But it's critical. It's critical if you're going to get the word out there. You know, when I first published, I thought, okay, you put it on Amazon and the world will find it. Nope, they won't. You know, not, not unless you let them know. So yeah. very important. And, and the last thing I would say is have fun doing it. If you're not having fun, you shouldn't be writing the book. It should be a, a, just a joy. You should want to sit down and, and write every day. It's... You know, it, the book will just come out of you if, if it's ready. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. And if you build it, they won't come. You must invite them. Uh, <laughs> this is what I always say. Yes. I mean, un unless your name is Barack Obama, you know, <laughs> yes. you, 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 you've got to you've got to build a following. Yeah, exactly. Well, he has a following. <laughs> right. exactly. If he publishes a book, everyone will buy it. Yes, exactly, exactly. Ethan, thank you so much for joining us today. I've really enjoyed uh, uh, listening about the book. And, you know, I love to hike. And so it's it's also just right up my alley. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Melody. Absolutely. And for everyone else, thank you for joining us today at Author Nation. Uh, we hope that you've seen how you can take uh, take storytelling to another level. I think that's really what Ethan has done here. Uh, so don't forget to visit authornation.community. That is where you will find our community and you can join the conversation and meet other fellow authors and get motivation and inspiration. And we always value your feedback and support. So if this has been an, an interview that has supported you, please like it, comment, and share it with somebody who will find it valuable. Keep writing, keep creating, and keep keep.
keep, I can say it, and keep sharing your stories with the world.